Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. This first female reproductive system lecture will discuss the general anatomy of the female reproductive system and dive into the histological organization of the ovaries and variety of follicles. Female reproductive system consists of the two ovaries, which are suspended within the pelvic cavity by the suspensory ligament, which goes up laterally and superiorly in this fashion, and the ovarian ligament, which attaches the medial aspect of the ovaries to the lateral aspect of the uterine body. Another component of the female reproductive system would be the uterus, which is this large pear-shaped structure, which has these two uterine tubes, also known as the fallopian tubes, the dome-shaped fundus, the main body, and the narrowed inferior portion called the cervix. And it also includes the vagina, which is this fibromuscular tube leading out into the external opening. And while these organs lay quote-unquote dormant, during childhood, from menarche to menopause, these structures play a critical role in endocrine regulation of reproductive cycle as well as the reproduction itself. Looking at the ovaries at macroscopic scale, each ovary is covered on the outside by a fibrous connective tissue capsule called the tunica albuginea. It's not quite as well defined or clear in the ovaries because it is not as thick or dense as it is in the testes. So Dr. Cooper will discuss tunica albuginea covering the testes. This structure is comprised of the dense irregular connective tissue and it forms a bit of a capsule-like structure for the ovaries as well as in the testes. The parenchyma of the ovaries are subdivided into the outer cortical layer and the inner medulla. The cortical layer contains numerous follicles, which are the oocytes that are surrounded by the protective ovarian stromal cells. And during the reproductively active age, this cortex will contain the follicles that are in various stages of growth. As you can see here, there's diverse histology of these follicles of various sizes. In addition to various sizes and shapes of follicles, we may also see some corpus luteum, which is the leftover follicular cells after the follicle has ovulated that release progesterone and estrogen. Looking at these structures histologically at a higher magnification, the outermost layer of the ovaries, so we're talking about even external to the tunica albuginea, we see that there's actually a single layer of simple cuboidal cells that surround the ovarian surface. And this structure is called the germinal epithelium. This is actually a sorosal layer that drapes over the ovaries. And here, the sorosal cells are not squamous, but instead are cuboidal to columnar in shape. So here's higher magnification of the external surface of the ovary. We can see that here is that loosely defined tunica albuginea, and outside of that, we're seeing this simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. This is the germinal epithelium, aka the sorosal layer. When this layer was first discovered, they were actually thought to be the germ cells themselves that gave rise to the oocytes, hence the term germinal epithelium, which we now know is actually not the case. But unfortunately, this name kind of stuck around. So it's important to know that this germinal epithelium is actually a misnomer. In the testes, however, there are also histological structures called the germinal epithelium. But in the case of testes, the germinal epithelium is actually an appropriate name since it is actually referring to the structures that produce the spermatocytes. And that will be highlighted in the male reproductive system lecture. The tunica albuginea, as mentioned before, is an ill-defined layer of dense irregular connective tissue surrounding the outer layer of the ovaries, but now deep to the germinal epithelium. 
Now, during fetal and childhood periods, the ovarian cortex, so about this region, contains hundreds of thousands of immature follicles called the primordial follicles in the background of ovarian stroma. So the primordial follicles would be the majority type of follicles we would see before puberty. However, starting at puberty, when the hypothalamus starts to release the gonadotropin-releasing hormones, or the GnRH, the basophils in the anterior pituitary will start to secrete the follicle-stimulating hormone, or the FSH, which then starts to simulate several follicles every month to start to grow. So as a result, during the reproductively active years, a variety of follicles in different stages of growth are observed in the ovarian cortex. And based on some characteristic morphologies, and based on some characteristic morphologies, there are different types of identifiable ovarian follicles that are called different names, such as the unilaminar primary follicle, multilaminar primary, the antral or the secondary follicles, and the mature or graphene follicles, and the atretic follicles. So let's look at each one's histology a little closer. The primordial follicle is something like this and these. And as the name suggests, these are the most immature forms of follicles that actually formed during the embryonic period and stuck around. The primordial follicle is comprised of the primary oocyte, which is the spherical cell with large cell cytoplasm and the nucleus. And the primary oocyte is actually arrested at prophase 1 of meiotic cell division. So it may still contain the nucleus with intact nuclear envelope, but we may see some thready chromosomes that have condensed and are waiting to separate. Such primary oocyte in the primordial follicle is surrounded by a single layer of flattened ovarian stromal cells called the follicular cells, which provides supportive roles for the primary oocytes. The unilaminar primary follicles are essentially the primordial follicles that have started to grow under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone. So the unilaminar primary follicles are characterized by the larger size of the primary oocytes. So here is the oocyte that has grown a bit in size. And here's the primordial follicle with the primary oocyte for a comparison. And at this stage in follicular growth, the flattened follicular cells have actually transformed into a cuboidal histology. So the primary oocytes in the unilaminar primary follicles are surrounded by a single layer of larger follicular cells, at which point the follicular cells are now called the granulosa cells. And here is another unilaminar primary follicle that is surrounded by a single layer of cuboidally shaped granulosa cells. Note also the ovarian stroma, the connective tissue component of the ovary, is actually quite cellular. And as the follicles start to grow, the stromal cells themselves, especially the ones that are immediately surrounding the follicles, will kind of arrange themselves into spherical conformation. And later on, the stromal cells too will start to provide some supportive roles as well. Now, the continued growth of the follicles under the FSH influence will result in a more mature form of follicles called a multilaminar primary follicle. Here, the primary oocyte is getting larger still, and we didn't quite catch the nucleus here. And this probably has more to do with the plane of section than the fact that this cell is lacking the nucleus, since the oocytes are quite large cells. At any rate, the oocytes themselves start to accumulate this acellular barrier on its external surface called the zona pellucida, which directly translates to the pale zone. And this structure plays an important role in blocking out the spermatocytes from directly entering the oocyte. Now, outside the zona 
Luna pellucida, the granulosa cells themselves have undergone quite a bit of proliferation. So as opposed to having a single layer of cuboidal granulosa cells, we now have multiple layers, hence the name, the multilaminar primary follicle. Another thing that is noticeable here is the clear boundary between the outermost layer of the granulosa cells and the surrounding stromal cells. And the stromal cells that are immediately outside this boundary start to actually enlarge and form a layer of capsule-like structure called the theca layer. So this would be the theca layer that is comprised of the stromal cells. And around at this point, the stromal cells that are immediately outside this basement membrane start to secrete the precursors of estrogen called the androsinidione for the granulosa cells to convert to the proper estradiol, which would then be released into the bloodstream to stimulate the uterine endometrial growth. So as the follicle itself is growing, it is starting to release these hormonal products that the uterine glands can respond to. The continued growth of multilaminar primary follicles leads to this structure called the antral or the secondary follicle, which is characterized by these fluid-filled spaces that start to accumulate within the granulosa cells. So again, antral follicles have the primary oocyte sites that are arrested at the prophase 1 of meiosis. They have still the zona pellucida that is surrounding the outside of the oocyte. And then we have the multiple layers of granulosa cells. But this time we have these fluid-filled spaces that'll start to eventually kind of coalesce into bigger and bigger fluid-filled spaces as the follicle itself grows. What's interesting also is that as the follicles are growing, they start to move towards the medulla of the ovary where the source of vasculature and fluids are located in the form of helicine arteries and veins. Another unique feature about the antral follicles is that the this theca layer, the stromal cells outside the granulosa layer, will start to differentiate into the inner and the outer theca layer, with the theca interna layer being comprised of a bit larger stromal cells and the external external layer, theca externa, being comprised of more of a flattened stromal cells that form an indistinct capsule-like structure. And these two theca layers will become more and more distinct as the follicle itself grows larger and larger. And again, theca interna has the endocrine function of producing the androsinidione which then the granulosa cells can convert to the estradiol, the estrogen product that is released into the bloodstream. And now we have the mature follicles. This is the most well-developed and the largest of the follicles that are characterized by a single and large fluid-filled space called the antrum. The oocyte is still a primary oocyte that's arrested at prophase 1 of meiosis. And at this point, outside the granulosa cell layer of this mature follicle, we can really see the distinctive theca interna cells comprised of larger spindle-shaped cells versus the theca externa, which is comprised of the flattened stromal cells that are essentially forming an indistinct capsule-like structure. And the internal aspect of the mature follicle, we can see that the outside of the zona pellucida, we have this layer of granulosa cells that are forming kind of a protective outer covering of the primary oocyte. This outer layer of granulosa cells are collectively called the corona radiata for resembling a radiating crown, if you will. And then we can also see another collection of granulosa cells that are attaching this oocyte complex to the rest of the granulosa cell layer on the outer aspect of the follicle. And this region or structure is collectively called the cumulus ophorus.
And as this mature follicle, also known as the graphian follicle, starts to enlarge, this growing follicle will actually start to come back up towards the tunica albuginea, towards the surface of the ovary, in preparation for the ovulation of this oocyte complex. And up until this point, the primary oocyte is still arrested in prophase 1. But just before the ovulation, the oocyte is triggered to finish meiosis 1 and enter meiosis 2, thus becoming a secondary oocyte. But even the secondary oocyte, as the ovulation occurs, is arrested again at meiosis 2 at metaphase. So once the oocyte is ovulated, this oocyte can now be called the secondary oocyte. It is surrounded on the outside by the zona pellucida as well as several layers of granulosa cells aka the corona radiata. The secondary oocytes are arrested at meiosis 2, at metaphase, and this meiotic division will not finish until fertilization is successfully achieved. Now lastly, the atritic follicles. Atresia itself refers to the absence or incomplete formation or even degeneration. So in the ovaries, numerous follicles at any stage of growth can undergo atresia, and this is actually happening at all times, from fetal stage up until menopause. So it is not uncommon to observe atritic follicles or the ones that are degenerating in the ovaries. Especially the larger follicles that are undergoing atresia are histologically quite noticeable by the abundant signs of apoptosis, not only of the primary oocytes, but also of the numerous granulosa cells. So again, the atritic follicles are referring to the degenerating follicles at various stages of growth, and they are recognized by the signs of apoptosis, where the cell membranes of the apoptotic cells are not distinctive at all, including even that of the oocyte. And some other signs of apoptosis would be a lot of these pycnotic or really condensed nuclei and cellular debris. And furthermore, the general tissue integrities of the follicles are lost as the apoptotic cells are essentially sloughing off and floating into the antrum, if you will. So again, such atritic follicles are not at all uncommon to see and observe in the ovarian histology. Now, during reproductive years, in addition to a variety of follicles, the corpus luteum may be observed as well in the ovarian cortex. The corpus refers to the body. Luteum or lutea refers to the color yellow. So corpus luteum literally translates to the yellow body. So this is a yellow body of about 1 to 2 centimeter diameter structure that can actually be observed with naked eyes on the ovarian cortex without the aid of microscopes. The corpus luteum is actually formed by what's remaining of the mature follicle after it has ovulated or released the oocyte complex into the peritoneum. So this ill-defined cellular structure in the corpus luteum is comprised of the remaining granulosa cells and the theca cells that have kind of collapsed onto themselves. At this point, the granulosa cells are called the granulosa lutean cells, and the theca interna cells become the theca lutean cells. The reason why the corpus luteum appears as this yellow body under naked eye observation is due to the rich steroid hormones, especially the progesterone, in addition to the estrogen that are being secreted by the granulosa lutean and theca lutean cells. The progesterone in particular that's released by the corpus luteum plays such an important role in signaling the endometrial glands to not only stick around but start to secrete glandular fluids in anticipation of the fertilized product to arrive into the uterus. 
An interesting fact about the corpus luteum is that they naturally have about the lifespan of 10 to 14 days to release the progesterone and estrogen. But in the absence of fertilization and particularly the placenta formation in the uterus, the corpus luteum will start to degenerate after about 14 days. And with their involution or degeneration, the uterine endometrial glands will start to shed, resulting in menstruation. And as the corpus luteum itself degenerates, numerous macrophages and fibroblasts will come in and replace this structure with dense irregular connective tissue scar, thereby becoming the corpus albicans or the white bodies. In case of successful fertilization and the implantation of the conceptus in the uterus, however, there's this developing placenta that'll start to secrete the human chorionic gonadotropin or the HCG. And HCG will actually signal the corpus luteum to persist. In fact, not only persist, but also to proliferate and really crank up the production of progesterone in addition to the estrogen in order to sustain the uterine endometrial glands. So the corpus luteum ends up sticking around and growing for up to about five months into pregnancy. In fact, the corpus luteum during pregnancy can get quite large. It can hypertrophy quite significantly to about half the size of the ovary itself. It's quite remarkable. But after about five months, the placenta itself can start to produce its own progesterone and estrogen level. And at that point, the corpus luteum can start to ingress and eventually degenerate. So the corpus albicans or corpora albicantia in plural are what remains after corpus luteum degenerates and becomes replaced with the scar tissue. So histologically, the corpus albicans looks like dense irregular connective tissue with lots and lots of collagen type 1 fibers and flattened fibrocytes that are wedged in between. And albicans, once again, refers to the color white, which is attributable to the grayish whitish collagen fibers that can be observed with naked eyes. So with increasing age, we can imagine how more and more corpora lutea are forming than degenerating. Therefore, the number of corpora albicantia will start to accumulate and increase in number with age. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.